going to start this morning teaching a series on tithe, on tithe. Now, I'm going to actually teach this in four consecutive lessons. My plan is to teach this in four, uh, in four consecutive lessons. So starting today and for the next several Sunday mornings, I'll be teaching on tithe. Now, perhaps you're thinking, that's a lot of time to spend on one subject, but there's a lot to be said about tithe. The Bible has a lot to say about tithe, and, and so what I plan on doing is to sort of take a very pragmatic, analytical approach to this subject. If we could uh, go ahead and run the title slide. So it's going to be a pragmatic, analytical study of what the Bible says about tithes. When I, or when you, go online, I don't recommend this, actually, um, and I can say this for sure because I've been studying this now for, for a while. Uh, but when you go on Google, for example, and type in tithe, boy, you're going to get so many opinions. And I'm going to tell you, I've started, to re I've started reading some of these opinions, and, I seen, and a, a lot of them are wrong, are absolutely wrong. There's a lot of ideas nowadays about tithes um, and uh, about money and giving in general that are absolutely not biblical. Um, and so, in order to avoid all of this, we're going to go to the fact book and learn about tithes from the very source of truth. Amen? Because when we start talking about money and we start talking about giving, there are some of us that are going to be a bit apprehensive. Some of you already have crossed your legs and your arms maybe. Preparing. <laughs> some of us, it, it just tends to make us sometimes a bit apprehensive, even a bit agitated for various reasons, okay? There are some people who just flat out love money, and they do not want anyone telling them what to do with theirs. I realize that. There are other people who perhaps have become wary and apprehensive about this topic because of misbehaving preachers and televangelists. I realize that. I acknowledge that today. I think surely there are probably many more people who uh, have mixed feelings about giving and tithe simply because they do not fully understand what the Bible says about it. But do you know that there is a proper solution for every case of unawareness, for every case of agitation and apprehension I just mentioned? Do you know what the medicine is? To simply teach you what the Bible says. In every situation, whatever your feelings of discomfort or agitation are about, the script, about this topic, the solution, the medicine, is to teach you what the Bible says. Because if you love money, you need to hear what the Bible says about that. And in, if you feel burnt or turned off by the actions of men and women in the ministry, then you need to hear what the Bible says. And if perhaps you just don't know and you've never heard it before, then you need to hear what the Bible says. And if you're already giving your tithes faithfully and you have this under your belt, then you need to hear what the Bible says because you need to make sure that you fully understand it and that you're able to explain it to someone else. The Bible says we ought to be ready to give an answer to every man. Okay? And you're going to be asked about this. You're going to have people that will question your giving, that will question your faithfulness, especially in the area of money. And you need to know why you're doing what you're doing, and you need to understand that you have a firm foundation for doing this. We need to hear what the Bible says about tithing, because if the Word of God commands us to do something, then there are no acceptable excuses for not doing it. Do you believe that? It's really that simple. The Bible says, for example, that in order to be saved, the first things that we must do is to repent. We must be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. We must be filled with the Holy Ghost. We see that pattern all throughout the New Testament. So now, would it be acceptable to say, well, you know, I just had a bad experience with a preacher one time that, that preached repentance. So for me, I just don't do repentance. Do you know what I'm saying? Would it, would it ever be acceptable to say, you know what, I've just been turned off to repentance because there's so many hypocrites that talk about it but don't do it. So I just 
repentance. What does the Bible say about it? Regardless of how you feel, regardless, and, and I understand there are some legitimate wrongs that happen. There are some things that you and I have seen and heard from other people that, that are very distasteful. But we want to look to Scripture. Because are there really any acceptable excuses for not repenting? No, there are not. You need to repent because the Bible says so regardless of how you feel, regardless of anyone else, what anyone else has done, what does the Bible say? In West Africa, uh, which is where my family and I were associate missionaries in West Africa, this is where we were last year. In case you don't know, this is where we're, we're returning for a couple years this summer. Okay, But it's very common in this area of the world for people to be afraid of water. I mean deathly afraid of water, especially large bodies of water like rivers and lakes. There are some strong traditional beliefs about evil spirits that live in the water that come up and pull people under and drown them whenever they get in the water. And so people, many people are genuinely terrified of getting in water. This presents an obstacle for baptism. Because in Africa, there are not very many, in West Africa especially, there are not very many baptism tanks. It's rare to find a, a baptism tank like we have here. So there are many people that spend all of their lives, if you can imagine, doing everything they can to avoid getting in water deep enough to be submerged. And then when they come to God, we tell them that they have to be submerged in water. There's a river right here. Put yourself in that scenario. We tell them that they have to be baptized in Jesus' name, buried with God, buried with Jesus in baptism, because that's what the Bible says. As you can imagine, there is a lot of initial fear to this. There's a lot of indifference to this, even resistance to this scriptural command in a lot of ways because of fear, because of past experiences. I've heard people tell me stories about relatives that have gone down and mysteriously drowned. And these people have good reasons to be afraid of getting in that water and being baptized. What is the solution? What do you do? The same thing we're going to do this morning. You just show them what the Bible says. You have to show them that it's not some man's opinion, it's not my opinion that you need to be baptized by submersion in water in the name of Jesus. This is the Word of God. You, need, you have to show them that this is not just some organization's preference. It's what God commands and His Word. And if we simply do it, whatever it is, we'll be okay. If we simply do it, whatever it is, you will be blessed. You will be saved by obedience to this word. So the solution to unawareness, the solution to confusion, agitation, indifference on any topic, I believe, is to first look to the scripture. Because if the Bible says it, then we ought to believe it. Actually, if the Bible says it, then that ought to settle the discussion. That ought to settle it for us. If the word of God commands it, then we simply must do it if we want to be pleasing and obedient to God. So, I said all that to say, for these reasons and because of this topic, I intend in these, these series to be very intentional about not inserting my own opinions on this topic of tithing. I intend to be very intentional about not presenting you with speculation about or commentary on this subject. But I'm going to do my best to stick to the explicit utterance of Scripture on this topic because that's what you need to hear. So I will teach and we will study and we'll have our questions answered about tithing from the Word of God. Is that fair? What does the Bible say? Let's go to that first question. What is tithe? This is the first question that we'll discuss. What is it? The word tithe or tenth, as it refers to tithe, is found 44 times in Scripture in 40 different verses. And the word tithe literally means tenth. That's all. It literally 
is a rendering of the English word tenth or a tenth part, a ten, ten percent in other words. So tithes refers to a tenth part or to 10% of something. But 10% of what exactly? For that answer, let's go to the Word of God, as I've said. 2 Chronicles 31, 5, and 6. 10% of what? 2 Chronicles 31, 5, and 6. That may be a little hard to see if you're in the back. I hope you got your phone or your Bible. Verse 5 says... And as soon as the commandment came abroad, the, the children of Israel brought in abundance the first fruits of corn and wine and oil and honey and all the increase of the field. I added that emphasis there. And the tithe of all things brought they in abundantly. Verse 6, and concerning the children of Israel and Judah that dwelt in the cities of Judah, they also brought in the tithes of ox, oxen, and sheep, and the tithe of holy things, which were consecrated unto the Lord their God. And they laid them by heaps. 10% of what? We see here that... The children of Israel, that is God's people, they brought the first fruits. This refers to the first part or the best part, the first 10%. Not just what was left over. They did not just bring the extra stuff that they had laying around. They bought the first 10% of their corn, of their wine, their honey, their ox, their sheep. This was their income. This was their currency in those days. They brought, the Bible says, the, the first 10%, remember, of all the increase. You have it up there still? Yes. They brought, the Bible says, the tithe of all things. How do we know that they brought the first 10%? Because the end of verse 5 clarifies that for us. They brought the tithe of all things. What does tithe mean? A tenth. They brought a tenth of all things in abundantly the children of Israel were commanded to pay tithes on all of their increase and we see here that that is what they did let's go to Proverbs 3 and 9 Proverbs 3 and 9 says honor the Lord with your substance if you'll sometimes I automatically do it, the these and the thys it's there but in my brain, when I'm reading, sometimes I'll automatically edit that out. So please excuse me if, if you see thee, thy, and I say your, you, something like that. I'm not trying to change the word of God. My brain just automatically changes that. So honor the Lord with thy substance and with the first fruits of all thine or all your increase. All your increase. The word substance literally means your wealth. That word substance there literally means your wealth or your money. Now, when we hear the word wealth, we think about a lot of money. But that's not the case in this verse. It's just saying with whatever wealth you have, and we all have wealth, things of value, money, you honor the Lord with your substance. And with the first part or the first fruits, how much of the part? 10% is the first part of all your increase. So as I've said, the word substance means money or wealth, but the last word increase, you're going to hear that a lot in the rest of this lesson, the increase is what you make or produce. It literally is your income. You honor the Lord with the first fruits of all your income, of all your increase. Notice here that the verse gives us a general command to honor the Lord with your money. And then it gets a little more specific and tells you how to do that specifically. It says, and we honor him also with the first fruits, that is the tithe, the first 10% of all our increase. Next slide. From these verses, we can see that biblical tithe is the first 10% of all your Increase. Our increase is everything that we make or earn, inherit, receive, including gifts and windfalls of money, including revenue, your income, etc. 
This includes our paycheck and our pensions and our disability checks, our Social Security income, our stimulus checks. It's all your increase. Sorry. I, you know what I'm saying? Your increase, simply put, is any money that is earned or received that you did not have before. An increase. If you're thinking about it like an accountant, it's not a, it's not a, uh, well, I, debit credit. I didn't do well in accounting. I'm, I made a C in college in accounting, so I probably shouldn't get on the county. But it's something that's, it's a plus. It's on the plus side of the ledger, right? It's not on the negative side. It's an increase. Anything that you receive in any form, however it comes to you, that increases you, that creates an increase, as it were, in your income. So sometimes we'll, we will say, well, it was only $10. It doesn't matter. That's $10 you didn't have before, so that is your increase. The figure, the amount, does not matter, whether 10 or a or million dollars. Biblical tithing is paying 10% on all your increase. I'm going to say that so much, you're going to be tired of hearing it, but I hope that you take it with you. 10% on all your increase. A biblical tithing is honoring God with 10% of everything you make, everything you earn, everything you receive. God gives us the tithe along with our paycheck. Think about this. When we receive our paycheck or the gift or whatever it is, the increase that we receive, the tithe is already there built in. He doesn't take it out in advance and only give you 90%. He gives you the full 100%. It's included there in that paycheck that you receive, and it's up to you and I to take that 10% out and to give it back to God. You see, it's an honor system. Remember Proverbs said, honor the Lord? Giving to God is based on an honor system, just as Proverbs 3 and 9 says. Giving, God gives you the tithes along with your paycheck to find out if you will be honorable. To find out if you are honorable. Because if you are, you'll bring the tithes that he's commanded back to him. Just because it's in your hand doesn't mean it's yours. If you don't, the Bible actually says that you are stealing from God in, Mal in the book of Malachi. We'll get to that a little bit later. But the point is, you have to be honorable. Let's go to the next slide. Do you remember the old newspaper boxes or paper dispensers? I don't even know. This was the best example I could find of an honor system. I asked, we don't have very many modern examples of honor systems because this ain't modern. We don't. Think about it. You know, if you think of one, get with me and find, I want to, for future teaching, I want a modern example of an honor system. I asked my 15-year-old son, Hody, I'm explaining what an honor system is, and I asked him, you know, is there anything like that today? And he looks at me like, what? Trust? You just give people something and trust that they're going to do, uh, he couldn't think of anything. The whole idea of an honor system, he's looking back at me like, who would do that? But here we go. So, Remember these things? Sure you do. Most of you probably. And I don't even know if they sell papers like this anymore in the paper box or the paper machine. I've not seen any lately. Maybe they do somewhere. So if you needed a newspaper during this time, you'd be able to go to the paper dispenser, paper box, paper machine. You put your 50 cents in or a dollar on Sunday because the Sunday paper has the funnies and it has the coupons. So it costs extra. You drop those quarters in, clink, clink, clink. You press the little button. And at the same time, you'd open with the other hand the handle. You pull it down. You've paid for one paper when you did that. But when you open the box up, lo and behold, there's like 20, 50 papers in there. See that? How many coupons do you need? It's an honor system because you paid for one, but when you open that box... There was no physical control, no accountability in place to keep you from taking two, three, four, ten papers if you wanted to, even though you only paid for one. An honor system. You all know what I'm talking about. If you were an honorable person, you would reach in there and only get what you paid for, and you would close that thing back and let it lock. If you wanted another paper, you'd put more money in and open it again. 
That was the way you got two papers if you were honorable. And the people who made things like this were counting on most people being honorable. Tithing is an honor system as well. So I ask you today, are you being honorable with the tithe that's coming included in your paycheck already? What are you doing with that 10% off the top? God is expecting us to put it aside, the 10% aside, the tithe aside, and give it back to him. We set it aside as a first fruit. This is an important word. As it, This word is often synonymous with the word tithe in Scripture. And in, God's trying to give you the idea that it's a good idea to set that money aside as a first fruit before you do anything else with it. Tithing needs to be like right at the top of your budget. Because why? If you don't designate it right away, if you don't put it aside right away, your human nature is going to have a tendency to forget or maybe get yourself in a bind and decide you need that extra 10%. And you're going to do something you shouldn't do. You're going to end up stealing. If you don't set it aside as a first fruit and give it to who it belongs to. The first 10% is not for you. It's for God. It is the tithe. So now we've established biblically that tithe is 10% of all, all, all our increase. This seems like a good time to find out whether you really love me or not. This is the hardest part of the lesson because it's true, but it ain't popular. This is a good time to talk about giving on your gross versus giving on your net. Many people in this building right now are going to have no issue with this because you're already doing it. It makes perfect sense. Um, so some of this, for some of you, this is going to be redundant. But, uh, you know, I want to make sure that we're all on the same page here. Your gross income is the income that you make before taxes and insurance or anything else is deducted. Your gross income. Your net income is what we sometimes call your take-home pay. This is the amount that is left over. After your taxes, insurance, perhaps retirement, whatever it is that comes out of your check before you bring it home, anything is deducted. That is your net. Now, the reason that I want to discuss this is because for a lot of people, their net pay is the dollar amount that they're seeing drop into their bank account, or it's actually the dollar amount that they're seeing on their check when they receive it. And for that reason... It's, a, it's kind of easy to make the mistake of thinking that the net amount is the amount you should be paying tithes on. But that is a mistake. Because, remember, we should be paying tithes, the Bible says, on all of the increase. All of your income, remember? And your net pay only represents a portion of your income, not all of it. Your net pay or your take-home pay is what's left over after our taxes have been paid, our insurance, whatever else. And now just because for most of us, our employer just automatically takes that out and they pay it for us. If you're self-employed, you're really going to understand this because you are paying yourself your own taxes. And that makes it a little bit easier because you see your gross right up front. But for a lot of us, we only see the net up front, which means somebody took your money and paid some bills for you already. But you need to go back and see what it was, the original figure that they took out, what they drew from. Because all of your increase is your gross. So as I was saying, just because someone paid those taxes for you doesn't mean they didn't do it with your money. <laughs> that is your increase, that gross figure. All of your income is your gross, not your net. What's left over after taxes has been paid is not what we made. The amount that we made is the amount before anything else was taken out. Does that make sense? What you actually made was the amount before anything else was deducted. But in, in reality, if we struggle with this, it is only because we're talking about giving and we're talking about God. Because I'll tell you what, we all talk about our income in terms of our gross all the time. We talk about when we quote how much we make, when we tell someone how much we make, we always quote a gross figure to them. Whether it's the annual gross figure or our monthly salary or our hourly wage, it's a gross figure that we're quoting. It's true. Can we get the next slide? Don't let this bother you. I'm going to walk through this. We do. 
If I were to ask you how much you make today, I guarantee you, you would give me a gross pay figure. You would tell me $10 an hour, $20 an hour, $3,000 a month. If you're military, you would give me a base pay figure or an annual amount, and these are all gross pay figures. Why? Because that is actually how much you make. That is your full increase. I want to give you a hypothetical example, okay? Let's take this line by line. I need to take it line by line, okay? And this is just a hypothetical answer. This is a hypothetical scenario. Let's look up to the top line. Show you what I'm talking about. If we make $10 an hour, and I pick 10 and 40 because simple math, okay? You make $10 an hour, and you work 40 hours a week, you're going to make $400, right? Does that check? So $400 is your gross total income. Now, let's say, now if we move to the next line, let's say $80 of that is taken out in taxes and insurance, whatever. That's about 20%. Maybe it's high, low, but... For this scenario, let's say about 80% of your 400 total income is deducted. So 400 minus 80. In this scenario, your take-home pay or your net income is $320. That's going to be the figure printed on your paycheck or dropped into your direct deposit. $320. Now here's where some people get confused and they begin to think that the $320 is all that they get paid. That's not true. And I'll show you why that's not true. Because if you took the $320, what you think you make when you're talking about giving, and you divided that by 40 hours, that's only $8 an hour. Now, do you make $8 an hour or do you make $10 an hour? Because you said you made 10 You see what I'm saying? I hope that this is making it's clear what I'm trying to say. When we communicate our hourly wage, we're communicating a gross figure almost every time because that's how much you make and it's only when we start talking about giving and finding a percentage to give to God that we decide to go with the low figure the net income in a lot of cases or maybe it's just that you've never heard this either way the truth is which represents your total income pop quiz which represents your total income line one thank you brother you're gross you're gross is correct. Next slide. You're gross. I've heard some people say, you know, I don't see the tax money. That's the government's money. That's not part of my increase. I've heard that. But you see, they're not thinking about the roads that they drive on every day that their tax dollars have built and maintain. They're not thinking about the public schools that their children went to or go to currently. They're not thinking about the firefighters and the policemen that their tax dollars pay to keep their communities and their families safe. They're not thinking about the military and the armed forces that are protecting our borders and protecting their freedom that are paid for by their tax dollars. Oh yes, you do see your tax dollars. Yes, your, your gross tax dollars is part of your increase. And you are benefited by those tax dollars every day and all day long. It's part of your increase. So to conclude, the first question, what is tithe? It's 10% of all of our increase. And in modern terms, this means that tithe is 10% of your gross income. You're all your increase, all of your income. That's the gross. Who pays tithes? I'm going to move quick on this one. We'll finish this question and be done. Numbers 18 and 26, who pays tithes? Numbers 18 and 26 says, thus speak unto the Levites and say unto them, when you give the children of Israel the tithe, excuse me, I didn't say that right. Say unto them, when you take of the children of Israel the tithe, which I have given you from them. So whose tithes is it? The children of Israel's tithes. They're giving it to the priests, the Levites. But it's the children of Israel that's paying tithes in this verse. Second Chronicles 31 and 5. This is the, one of the verses we just read in the beginning, but we're going to look at it in, 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 for this question as well. It says, as soon as the commandment came abroad... The children of Israel brought in abundance the first fruit of corn and wine and oil and honey and all the increase of the field and the tithe of all things. They brought in abundantly. Who is the they? 
The children of Israel, once again, we see bringing the tithes as they were commanded to. The children of Israel were God's people in this context. And who are God's people today? The church. You and I. We are. Yes. You and I. The Bible answers the question of who pays tithes by this. God's people pay tithes. In Malachi chapter 3, we can go to the, the Malachi 3 and 8. In Malachi chapter 3, God is once again talking to his people, Israel. We know that he's talking to Israel because in verse 6, he calls them the sons of Jacob. You sons of Jacob. Who was Jacob? Israel. Jacob's name was changed to Israel. So the children of Israel, the sons of Jacob, was another way of saying children of Israel. And God is speaking once again to his people. And he says to them in Malachi 3 and 8, Will a man rob God? Yet you have robbed me. But you say, you ask this question, Wherein have we robbed you, God? And God answers, You've robbed me in the tithes and offerings. God expects his people to pay tithes. In fact, it says God is making the claim here that you are robbing him when you don't. Stealing from God. That's a very serious accusation. That's a very serious thing. When we talk about, we'll talk about this more important verse actually in a future lesson. But I want you to see here by this verse that God is very serious about his people paying tithes. He expects his people to pay tithes. It is the people of God that pay tithes. 1 Corinthians 10 and 26. For the, the first part is King James Version. Then I'll read it in the NIV. For the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. NIV says, the earth is the Lord's and everything in it. I put the NIV up there just because it makes it a little bit plain. It's absolutely imperative that we have the right mind and the right spirit about God and about money. Scripture tells us plainly that we might consider our money, we might consider this to be our money, but it's not really ours. It's His. All of it is. Is your money in this earth? Yes, it is. Mine is. My paycheck doesn't come Signed by the signature of God. We understand spiritually it comes from him. But your money is in this earth. You are in this earth. Jesus even said it. You're in this world. You may not be of it. But you're in it right now. That means it's his. Your money. Your increase. You. It's actually him. It belongs to him. Deuteronomy 8, 17 and 18. And thou say, you say in your heart. This is our tendency to say this. My power and the might of my hand has gotten me this wealth, this money. But, here's what you need to do. You shall remember the Lord your God because it's Him that gives you the power to get wealth, to get this money. It is Him that has done that. It is His and He gives you the power to get what you have. We, you have to have the right attitude and the right mindset about God and your money. You have to understand that it is the very goodness of God that has given you what you have. And when your mind lines up with these passages, when your spirit is right, it will be a whole lot easier to give this little old 10%. He's letting you live off of 90% of his money. And is asking for 10 in return. If we keep that perspective all along, well, would you mind standing to your feet? If we keep that perspective all along, it'll be a lot easier to do. Because it's a whole lot easier to give to God when you realize that it's His anyway. It's His anyway. Puede estar en pie esta mañana. Amen. Can we all stand together this morning? Puede decir conmigo, aleluya. Can you say with me, aleluya? Aleluya. Aleluya. Alabanzas a Dios. Praises to God. Exaltamos al Señor. We exalt the Lord. El Apocalipsis. The Book of Revelation. Contiene siete cartas. Has seven letters. Para siete congregaciones. To seven churches. Que estaban dispersas. That were dispersed. En Asia Menor. In Asia Minor. Y hay una en específico que es la carta a la iglesia en Filadelfia. There is a spe specific one that's the church in Philadelphia. Capítulo 3 de Apocalipsis. In Revelation chapter 3. Y dice, escribe al ángel de la iglesia en Filadelfia, el verso 7. The 
to the angel of the church in Philadelphia I write uh, pero después de, del mensaje que da el Señor allí and after the message that the Lord gives to the church of Philadelphia el verso 11 verse 11 dice he aquí yo vengo pronto retén lo que tienes para que ninguno tome tu corona says behold I come quickly hold that fast which thou hast that no man take thy crown y yo creo que estamos en un tiempo de retener I believe that we're in a time where we need to hold fast. De retener lo que tenemos. To take hold and hold on to what we have. Retener el evangelio de Jesucristo. Hold on to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Retener sus promesas. Hold fast to his promises. Él viene pronto. He comes quickly. Él viene pronto. He comes quickly. Él viene pronto. He's coming quickly. Es tiempo de retener. It's time to hold fast. Hay una corona. There is a crown para cada hijo de Dios. to each child of God. Esa corona that crown será puesta will be placed sobre aquellos on those que retienen those that hold fast lo que Dios les ha that what Lord, hold fast to what the Lord has given them. Así que estuvimos aquí ayer. So we're here yesterday. Estamos hoy aquí. We're here again today. Mañana estaremos aquí. Tomorrow, Lord willing, we'll be here. Somos el pueblo de Dios. We are the children of God. Diga amen. Say amen. Diga amen. Say amen. Cante al Señor.
chain is broken. Oh, let's lift our hands and let's sing that. Sing every chain. Every chain is broken. Every chain is broken. Every chain is broken. How the blood over them. Sing every chain is broken. Every chain is broken. Every chain is broken. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Every chain is broken. Every chain is broken. He's ready to set you free today. I'm telling you right now. He is ready to set you free to break your chains. What we're about to do next is part of is part of that process. What we're about to do next is critical to that process. We are about to pray. We are about to call on Him. We are about to ask Him to break some chains for us and for some other people and to do some things that only He can do. Oh, hallelujah. He's a prayer answering God. He's a miracle working God. I know that. I know that. I want to read a scripture from you. 1 Timothy 2. And verse 8. 1 Timothy 2 and 8 says, I will therefore that men, people, men and women, everywhere lift, uh, should pray. That, that men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting. He's saying, I would. This is another way of saying that I wish, it is my will, it is my desire that people everywhere would pray. How? Lifting up holy hands without wrath and without doubting. So you'll see people raising their hands, and you've raised your hands surely perhaps in prayer before, but he's talking about lifting our hands. And I got to thinking about this scripture, you know, we lift our hands. I lift my hands for different reasons. There are times when I've lifted my hands as if to say, God, take it, take it, take it. I can't handle this anymore. I can't deal with this. There's times when I've lifted my hands in surrender saying, God, take me. Do with me what you want. And there's times where I've lifted my hands to say, Lord, come by here. Lord, help me. Give me. I, I need. I need you. And you know, this verse compensates for these different postures of prayer. As we pray today, I would that you would lift your hands. And the Bible says, as you lift up those holy hands of yours, there's two different postures of prayer. There's a posture to be without wrath, without anger. That is, you are submitted Unforgiveness is gone. Ugliness is gone. Pride. You're lifting your hands in surrender, in submission. No wrath. No hidden agenda. And the second posture is that of expectation. You're lifting your hands with an expectation without doubting that He is going to meet you here, that He is going to do it. So yes, we'll lift our hands in, in prayer today, but we're going into prayer with submission and we're going into prayer with humility and with expectation that He is in control of you, that He's in control of your situation and that He will answer, that He will do it. Praise God. We have some prayer requests here that we're going to bring to the Lord in prayer. And as we pray, 
if you want to come to this altar, we will pray with you. We'll do so safely. We'll do so observing, observing uh, some, some certain guidelines. But feel free to come to this altar and pray if you want someone to pray with you. Or you can pray right there at your seat. We're going to uh, pray for Sister Linda Brown today. She has cancer, as many of you know, and she's been going through chemo, and, and that's causing her a lot of sickness. But we want to pray that God would strengthen her, but that God would heal this cancer in her body once and for all. I don't know about you, but I believe that she is going to be healed of this cancer with all of my heart. I don't doubt it for one minute, and I've told her that. Let's pray for healing today for Sister Brown, complete healing for this cancer. Let's pray for Sister Harper, Karen Harper. She also needs healing in her body for her lungs and just her total body. God is going to heal Sister Harper. Let's lift her up today. Marcia McNeil needs, he uh, needs some good health and encouragement today. Sister Barbara Sims has developed uh, an infection in her spinal fluids. And so she needs a complete healing today. Remember to lift Sister Sims up. Uh, Neil and Sandra Blizzard need an urgent healing from COVID. They've been hospitalized for a while now uh, with COVID, and, and they need an urgent healing. And finally, uh, Liam McDowell, this is John and Natalie's son, he needs healing in his eyes. He has alternating extropia in his eyes. And they are believing, and we're believing with them, that God's going to heal little Liam this morning in the name of Jesus. I also have... Uh, Jeanette Spencer needs healing from a broken hip and a leg amputation. And Carlette Steele needs prayer that God would give her family peace and strength. And you have needs, and I have needs. And so we're going to lift those up right now all together. In the name of Jesus, let's do that. God. Great is your faithfulness to me. Great is your faithfulness to me from the rising sun to the setting say I will praise your name great is your faithfulness to Your faithful 
there's a man by the name of R.G. Lee Tournay, and he was a Christian industrialist that dedicated his life to being a businessman for God. And he was hugely successful, and he designed and developed his own line of earth-moving equipment. As a matter of fact, it, uh, history tells us that he provided about 70% of the earth-moving equipment for World War II, and that also he paved more than 15, well, half of the 1,500 miles that it took to build the Alcan Highway that led uh, from Alaska to the United States, which I traveled as a child several times. And there were times that that mountain pass was so thin that you couldn't pass. And I can remember that a man almost ran us off the mountain because he didn't realize up ahead that uh, the road was extremely narrow and we almost died. But I can remember as a child traveling that way and it was all graded. And it was because of this man, because he uh, wanted to do something great for the world and he did. And uh, it goes on to let us know that he created over 300 inventions and hundreds of patents and uh, he was extremely successful financially and he increased his giving to the point that he was giving 90% of his income back to the Lord. 90%. He once said, I shovel the money out and God shovels it back and he's got a bigger shovel than I do. <laughs> and you might think, well, I could give 90% too if I was a multimillionaire, but I want you to understand he didn't start out that way. So this morning, I encourage you and I want to gently challenge you that whatever percentage of your giving is today, when you have an opportunity, make it a lifelong plan to try to increase whatever it is you do. God will bless you. I remember getting a, over a $20,000 raise at one time. God is faithful to the faithful. I get checks in my mail frequently. God is faithful to the faithful. And there are times that I, I don't even know where it comes from, but God. Because when you're faithful to him, he's going to be faithful to you. Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, we just thank you for the word that has been spoken here this morning. And also, Lord God, the spirit that's in this service. Lord, I ask that you would touch each and every one that is here, Lord God. And let them accept the challenge to try you and see if you will not pour them out a blessing that they cannot contain. In Jesus' mighty name.
Genesis 4 and 3, And in the process of time it came to pass that Cain brought of the fruit of the ground an offering unto the Lord. And to Abel he also brought the firstlings of his flock and of the fat thereof. And the Lord had respect unto Abel and to his offering. But unto Cain and to his offering he had no respect. And Cain was very wroth and his countenance fell. And the Lord said unto Cain, Why art thou wroth? And why is thy countenance fallen? If thou doest well, shalt thou not be accepted? And if thou doest not well, sin lieth at the door. And unto thee shall be his desire. And thou shalt rule over him. Quickly, I'm going to go to the ESV translation. In the course of time, Cain brought to the Lord an offering of the fruit of the ground. And Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock and of their fat portions. And the Lord had regard for Abel and his offering. But for Cain and his offering, he had no regard. So Cain was very angry and his face fell. The Lord said to Cain, why are you angry and why has your face fallen? If you do well, this last verse here in this translation is where I wanted to bring clarity to. If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door. Its desire is contrary to you, but you must rule over it. I want to preach for a short period of time on this subject. Unacceptable sacrifices. Can you say that? Unacceptable sacrifices. Dear Heavenly Father, we come before you today. God, I pray that my heart be pure. That my intentions be pure. God, I thank you for everything that you have given us. You have been faithful when we didn't deserve it. You have loved us when we weren't worthy. But God, we stand here today looking to grow and to improve in who you've made us to be and who you've called us to be. For that, Lord, we thank you. And the church said amen. Unacceptable sacrifices. The scripture is not specific, but we could summarize or surmise that no instruction had been given by God in scripture regarding sacrifices at this point. This is the beginning. This is Genesis. It's possible that Cain did not know what types of of sacrifices would be pleasing. Maybe it was just because he was not as spiritually in tune as his brother Abel. However, he could have realized his mistake and corrected it. This is where many people today, it may have been a long time ago, but for whatever reason our human nature just, just hangs with us. Over thousands of years, not much has changed. Oftentimes, we make mistakes. It's the admitting it part and changing that is the hard part. Maybe he could have traded fruits and vegetables for a lamb to sacrifice. Maybe for correction, he could have laid down his his ego and his anger and instead picked up obedience and repentance. Had he not been so enraged by God's refusal to accept his sacrifice, maybe he could have thought clearly. Rage and anger has a way of manipulating our ability to process. Life has a way of causing those things to happen. His anger blinded him to the possibility and created an impossibility for himself to be corrected. However, one thing is obvious. No matter how you interpret it, the sacrifice was not pleasing to God. Whether he didn't know, whether, whether it wasn't really a, a sacrifice, maybe it wasn't a tenth of his gross. Maybe, maybe it wasn't a, a sacrifice that was, that was just enough. Now, I know all these things hadn't been taught, but there was a point In his life where he could have corrected and done things differently. Cain's skewed view and anger led to the death of his brother. As the modern day church, we are full of technology and consumerism. We are caught up in our own lives, the day to day, if you will. 
We lose sight of our true purpose and calling. We oftentimes appear as godly, obedient, and on the surface, we are cheerful. We are the definition of a, of a church-going person. But unfortunately, we fail to produce the fruits of a walk with God. Over the years, we have built beautiful altars. They are magnificent in how they look. They are rising structures with beautiful carpeted areas that we can come and lay and cry out and, and ask for forgiveness. We have built altars, but for some reason, we oftentimes will neglect the true sacrifice, only being pleased with a few tears that were shed at the altar and being pleased with, with, with asking for forgiveness, but no change really coming into our lives. That is an unacceptable sacrifice. Your tears, how they move the emotions of others around you and how they, they even affect your heart and get you to pour out. But if nothing changes... The attitude still stinks. If nothing is, is directed and, and changed, then what good is that sacrifice? It is not pleasing to God. Now please understand in the terms that sound harsh. Really when I preach, I just preach to myself. So you guys can listen today, but don't get offended. I'm just practicing on you for all the stuff i got to fix in my life. Okay. Our altars look good. Our hair is perfectly parted. But, but I often wonder if something was lost in translation from the Bible to our hearts. You see, here is the fact. You, you can put as much lipstick on a pig as you want to. And it's still a pig. We, we can dress up a sinner... As much as you want to. I can fix this and make myself look just right. But I'm still a sinner. Contrary to common belief, the exterior is not proof of your interior. The interior always bleeds out onto the canvas of your exterior. It is not pleasing to just look the part. If I can trick you and make you think that I've got it all together. But heaven is not my home. Then what good is all the effort I put in to deceive you? What does it profit a man to gain the whole world and to lose his soul? What does it profit a man to look the part and not make it to heaven? Profits him nothing. In short, the real me can only be hidden for so long before people see the proverbial true colors. Have we, the church, sorry, so sorry, have me, Justin, become so spiritually presumptuous that I believe acting Christian precludes the need for conviction against sin. Have we made sacrifices for the affirmation of our peers or parents and critical observers or is it a sacrifice that creates a true relationship with God? What is your sacrifice? It is a sacrifice nonetheless. To trick others or to do it right is a sacrifice. Which one is acceptable to God? It costs you something either way. It is a sacrifice. Is it acceptable to God? At whose feet do our priorities lie? At the feet of Christ or at the feet of our flesh? If the world doesn't have a relationship with God and you are the only Jesus they see, what are they going to find underneath the surface of the facade? What are they going to find on your altar? Are they going to find an acceptable sacrifice or deep lying within who you are? Are they going to find a lipstick painted pig? Is that too harsh? It's just an analogy. I'm not calling you pigs. You're good people. You're good people. This means that we have pretty altars with wonderful upgrades and majestic buildings. But if the world can't see the real us and that we have a relationship with him, then what good is the sacrifice in the first place? Don't be lukewarm. Choose you this day who you're going to serve. Decide what side of the aisle you're going to be on. Decide is your sacrifice going to be pleasing to God or is it simply going to be able to please the passerby? What's your sacrifice for? 
Beauty soon shall fade away, but ugly holds its own. It's going to stay around. Have we just built nice altars but giving unacceptable sacrifices? Have we redefined holiness as a spiritual characteristic that is only skin deep? Or do we adhere to the true definition that reflects the character of Jesus Christ? Do you see the divide? Do you see the chasm? We can possibly look the part and act the part. But do we really mean it? In the book, To Win Friends and Influence People, he, he talks about something at the very end of that book. And it's how, it's how people, salesmen, right? A salesman's your best friend. When you pull onto that car lot, he don't love nothing more than you, right? You, you, uh, he has a dog just like you have. His favorite car is the one you drove in on, and he's just going to sell you another one just to make you happy. He loves the color uh, uh, of your eyes. He loves everything about you. But there's this, this one key. He just wants your money. And the thing about it is, that mimics the characteristics of somebody that's truly trying to be a friend to you. If I'm truly trying to be a friend, oftentimes I'll like your car. I'll appreciate your hairstyle. I'll, I'll compliment your dog. But the key difference is sincerity. One was going for the money. One was going for relationship. If we're not careful in how we develop our relationship with God, we will simply look the part. We will be a salesman, if you will. If I could just convince my friends and neighbors that I love Jesus, if I could sell them on the fact of that, it looks similar to the person that really loves Jesus. It looks much like the person that's relationship. But at the end of that book, the key is a real person that can win friends and influence people is one that does and says things with sincerity. It's not just a facade. If you're walking this faith with God and it's just a facade, can I be honest with you? It's an unacceptable sacrifice. You have got to find somewhere deep within your heart that says, I don't just do this to play the part. I don't just do this to look the part. I do this because it is in my spiritual DNA. I do this because I found an altar and my sacrifice was acceptable. I found an altar and I found a relationship with Jesus. And it's not just a facade. It's real. The altars of Cain and Abel might have looked the same. But Cain, your sacrifice is unacceptable. We might lift our hands the same. We might give the same amount of money. But is your sacrifice one that is unacceptable? Motive matters. Are your hearts pure? Is my heart really pure? Is my heart pure? I hope this is my water. If not, we're going to risk it. In Jesus' name. And the church said amen. I was about to die. <laughs> Don't laugh too much. I'll just keep making jokes. I'm on a time schedule here. If you'd give me the latitude today, I would like to challenge the saying, if it looks like a duck, if it quacks like a duck, it's a duck. Could I challenge that today? Is that Okay. I'm going to tell you a story. A raft of ducks were flying south for the winter. On their long journey, they flew over a small pond full of cold water and plenty of room to land. The flock was encouraged to see a plethora of ducks already in the water, their quacking reverberating across the pond. This very fact gave them the assurance that the water was a safe place for them to land. But as they came in for the landing, something very peculiar began to happen. Loud noises rang out across the water. Ducks began to fall from the sky like an aerial bombing. Fear gripped their quacking hearts. Quickly, the lead duck pulled up and began to guide the flock to safety. After taking count of the, the loss and being literally shell-shocked, they regrouped and continued on their journey. Once they caught their breath... Miss Duck looked at Mr. Duck and said, What in the world happened back there? He said, I'm not sure they looked like ducks. They sounded like ducks, but they were not ducks. That was the punchline. If you missed it, you're supposed to laugh at that part. In this childish analogy, we find a parallel with the church. You see, what they saw in the water was not really ducks. It was decoys for hunters. 
The decoy inevitably became the enemy. The thing that they thought was safe. The church that they thought was a good place to land. They were just passing by. They were going to stop for a little bit. And, and it seemed like a safe place to land. But you see, what you see is not always what you get. Just because the altars probably look the same doesn't mean the sacrifice is just as acceptable when put on it. Did you hear that? Just because the altars may look similar doesn't mean that the sacrifice that's on it is acceptable. I'm sure that this doesn't apply to you, so I'm going to again direct this towards me. But the Bible tells me in Matthew 5, 14 what I should be. Ye are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. It is at this point, though, something seems to be lost in me. Instead of being the light of the world, I end up being a decoy in the church. Instead of forgiving the woman caught in the act of adultery in John chapter 8, I am the first to pick up the stone. Instead of, of being a duck that offers safety, I am one that offers danger as people come and are trying to find a safe place to land. They are trying to find out if the sacrifice that has been given is true and holy. If the people that were there before are real or if they're just a decoy. Instead of an acceptable sacrifice of patience and forgiveness, I place upon the altar an unacceptable sacrifice of judgment and condemnation. I am not a real duck. I am a decoy. I sound like a duck. I look like a duck. After church, you should hear me quack. But what does the world see when they get closer? The closer they get, do I look more like Jesus or do I look more like a decoy? The closer they get to know me, do I begin to mimic Jesus or do I become their worst enemy? If you haven't committed yourself to living a life pleasing to God, and the definition of true holiness. I'm afraid to say that it could, it could potentially be a decoy situation. When that person hurting comes in and, and finds out that you're not who you say you are. I have to be authentic. I have to be real in a world that is so full of fake in a world that is so full of, of facades, in a world that is so full of people acting like they love you and care about you, the church ought to be one place that people can fly and land in this cool water. It ought to be one place that they know that the altar, there was a sacrifice that was acceptable, that the altar was prayed over, and people really cared what they put on it. We don't just sing good songs or preach good messages. We live it when we leave here. Do I love to follow God or do I love to bring my sacrifice reluctantly? Do I love people or am I like Matthew 7 and 5 where I would rather pay more attention to the speck of dust in your eye than the beam in my own? That is an unacceptable sacrifice. That is a path of spiritual destruction. It is the decoys of the church that put a bad taste in the mouth of the unsaved. It is the fraud that can't be honest with him or herself about their relationship with God that sends a signal to the hurting and the weary to keep flying on to the next watering hole. It is the unacceptable sacrifice that hangs in the air like a foul smell. God is not pleased. God created this to have a relationship with you. Built on a foundation of love and sincerity. He don't want you to act the part. He doesn't want a decoy. He doesn't want you to play church. He wants you to be the church. He wants you to live the church. He wants you to live the gospel. He wants you to love the gospel. He wants a real relationship with you. No more unacceptable sacrifice. No more unacceptable sacrifices. Musicians come. 
Today across the congregation of you wonderful people, we find ourselves at a crossroads of sacrifice. Do we just look the part in a hope to please pastor or do we strive for true holiness that runs deeper than a superficial walk, talk and appearance? Something that is deeper than, than an instant gratification of the approval of those around us. Do we bring a meat offering with a cheerful heart or do we bring diced tomatoes simmered in a stew of begrudging disdain? What is our purpose? Are our motives pure or do we whip out our microscope to see the speck of dust in their eyes instead of realizing the frailty and the failures of my own what is my purpose are our motives pure do we carry a bucket of forgiveness or a rock of stones we are at a crossroads the average Christian Simply has a relationship at dinner when they say their three-second prayer. To live as Christ. To some, nothing more than a, a cheap throw-me-up prayer. Conviction is so far removed from their current lifestyle that they no longer understand what being convicted means. Can I tell you, you are more than that. We are more than that. We can hold ourselves to a standard that is pleasing to God. And I don't care what the enemy says. We can do it. We can be it. We're not perfect, but we press towards the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. God does not need your perfection. He needs you to submit with no reservation. An acceptable sacrifice will always cost you something. It means that something in you must die for the Holy Spirit to live. The Apostle Paul said he dies daily. Would you stand with me? That's an acceptable sacrifice to die daily. We have to commit ourselves to not being the decoys of the church, but being the cool, clear water that people can land in. We have to commit ourselves to an altar of acceptable sacrifices not the unacceptable I implore you today these altars are open but I pray that this conviction that is on my heart falls upon your heart I see the deficit in my life I see the failures of my pursuits but I implore you today evaluate your sacrifice would you come to this altar and would you begin to lay on this altar a sacrifice that is acceptable would you come right now and begin to pour your heart out to God? The sacrifice that is pleasing to Him. The sacrifice of yourself is the only sacrifice God will accept. The sacrifice of self-will, sinful choices, carnal preferences, and the infilling of the Holy Spirit is what makes us each holy before the Lord. Being holy before God requires a personal, intimate, inner commitment anyone can act walk and talk and look the part but are you the real thing come on would you pour it out to God